Good morning. Welcome to chapel. We are so excited for today for many reasons. First of all, we want to give a special welcome to our Orange Folder friends. If you have an Orange Folder preview people, can you wave them in the air? Yes. Yes. We are very excited to have you as guests today. We know this is an important part of your decisions, and we just say welcome. Welcome to families, to parents, to those of you who come to consider Greenville. We hope that you have a meaningful time today. To pastors, can pastors raise their hands? We have a whole posse here, so thank you. We have a very special guest today that uh, Dr. Estevez will introduce, and so pastors, welcome. We're very glad that you're here. And to our students, raise your hands if you're a GC student. Yay! <laughs> welcome. We are glad that you're here and um, making just part of our routine showing up three days a week. If we could do this, let's stand and greet someone around you at this time. Let me tell you our order for chapel today. We're going to begin with a call to worship, and we will continue with a couple of worship songs that engage us in singing together. And then, as I said, Dr. Estevez will introduce our very special guest, which we're so excited for today. And uh, I think we're going to hear from the Lord. And I think that it's important that we do that, not by ourselves, but that we come together as the people of God, whether we are part of this community or whether we're guests, this is a very significant time. So if we could, um, let's stand to do our call to worship together. This is some words out of uh, the lectionary in Lent from Psalm 27. I'll read the white. If you could announce and, and declare the yellow text, that would be great. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. One thing I ask from the Lord that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord. And to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. And then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Amen.
Father, we sing your story this morning, and what a great story we proclaim. You are an awesome yet humble God. Um, You've become human and entered our fallen world so that we could be ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. And we respond with grateful hearts, full of adoration, yet also with a posture of repentance, for we're aware of our shortcomings and our sins. We trust in your forgiveness and in your faithfulness through Christ our Lord. And we ask again this morning that you'd be faithful and breathe on us with your Holy Spirit. Speak forth a word that changes us. 
that transforms us into Christ's image. For who can leave an encounter with you and not be changed? And you are among us. So we uh, humbly ask that you continue your work in us this morning. In Jesus' powerful name, we pray this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Welcome to chapel. On behalf of the president, our faculty, our staff, administrators, welcome to our guests. It's so special to have you among us. Today is a special day. It's a special day because we have a special person among us to talk to us, to encourage us, to motivate us, and at the same time challenge us. Justo Gonzalez is a Cuban-American Methodist historian and theologian. He is more Cuban than he is American. Okay. <laughs> he is a prolific author and an influential contributor to the development of Christian theology with particular emphasis in Latino-Latina theology. Dr. Gonzalez received his master's from Yale and then went on to become the youngest person to be awarded the historical theology doctorate at Yale. That's an amazing feat. Gonzalez taught at the Evangelical Seminary of Puerto Rico for eight years and then followed another eight years at Candler School of Theology of Emory University in Georgia. He is now pleasantly retired and at our request, we bother him to come to us this morning. In 1984 and 85, Gonzalez wrote a popular two-volume textbook entitled The Story of Christianity that covers the history of the church from founding till present at that time in a readable, manageable, chewable style. He's also the author of three-volume work titled History of Christian Thought. Both works commonly are used in, as college and seminary textbook. Our very own Dr. Brian Hartley is a fan. Additional books include Acts, the Gospel of the Spirit, the Apostle Creed for Today, The Changing Shape of Church History, Christian Thought Revisited, Three Types of Theology, The Early Church of the Dawn Reformation, Essential Theological Terms, Faith and Wealth, A History of Early Christian Ideas on the Origin, Significance, and the Use of Money, For the Healing of the Nations, The Book of Revelation in the Age of Cultural Conflict, on and on and on. His wife, Catherine Gonzalez Gonzalez, she says, don't say that first last name. A scholar in her own right is a professor emerita at Columbia Theological Seminary, and the two have co-authored several books. She also joins us this morning. So Catherine, can you please stand so that we can welcome you? So let me put it this way. Dr. Gonzalez is to Christian theology scholarship as the Beatles were to popular music. <laughs> as Martin Luther King Jr. was to civil rights. As Harriet Tubman was to the abolitionist movement. As oxygen is to the brain and protein to our bones. He's a living encyclopedia and we are grateful, honored, and pleased to have Dr. Justo Gonzalez with us this morning. Dr. Gonzalez, bienvenido at Greenville College. Un placer de tenerlo con nosotros. Thank you. Good morning. A couple of corrections to the introduction. First of all, that business about being the youngest was a long, long time ago. <laughs> Secondly, that business about being special just ain't true. We are all special. We're all special because we have been loved by the special God of all creation. And in that sense, each of us is absolutely unique, special, lovable, and loved. And that's the reason, the main reason why it's a pleasure for me to be with you here to, with, today with other people who share the same faith and the same experience. I will begin by reading some words from the book of Acts in chapter 6, beginning at the very beginning of that chapter, and thus says the word of the Lord. 
Now, in those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the body of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to the prayer, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole multitude, and they chose uh, Stephen, a man full of the, spirit, of the faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. They set them before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands upon them. The book of Acts, from which I have heard, read these words, uh, begins with uh, a very dramatic episode, the story of Pentecost, that moment in which, uh, through the power of the Spirit, all barriers are broken, and uh, the Mede and the Parthian and can understand as well as the Cappadocians and the Elamites, and the Spirit is poured upon young and old, male and female, and they all speak by the power of the Spirit. At Pentecost, all these various people heard the gospel, but they were not all made to understand the Aramaic that the apostles spoke. The text tells us that they heard each in their own tongue. You see, if, if the purpose of the Spirit was to have everybody understand, understand what was being said, there were two options. One option was to make everybody understand Aramaic, which they called Hebrew then, but it wasn't. It was Aramaic, which was what the apostles spoke. Another option was to make everybody understand in their own tongue. The purpose of communication would have been the same, but the consequences are different. Because if you make everybody understand in the word of the, in the, gospel, in the language of the apostles, that means that the language of the apostles will be forever normative in the life of the church. And it would mean also that the practices and the customs and, the, and everything that comes from the apostles, that's going to be what's going to be dominant always in the life of the church. But if you make the Mede understand in their own language and the Parthians and so on, then it means that now there is no dominant language in the church. Let me put it this way. I don't know if there was an Aramaic-only movement in first century Palestine. <laughs> But if there was, the Spirit's work at Pentecost is God's final and absolute no on any such movement. Hmm? I could say much more about that, <laughs> but we have a saying in Spanish, al buen entendedor, pocas palabras bastan, which literally means those who can understand don't need too many words, or as the book, the holy book, says, those who have ears, let them listen. Yet, even in the book of Acts, not all is rosy. It all starts with that marvelous story about Pentecost, but not all is rosy. In chapter 5, just before what I have read, Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead for having lied to the Spirit. Catherine was preaching about that text one day, and I challenged her to call the sermon, Drop Dead for God. But, <laughs> but she wouldn't. <laughs> uh, and in chapter 6, the chapter we have just begun reading this morning, we, see, we are told that the Hellenists murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Hmm? Now look more clearly at what the dynamics involved are. Hmm? First of all, let's understand all of these people are Jews. The ones that they call Hebrews and the ones that they call Hellenists or Greeks, they're all Jews. But there are some who are, call themselves Hebrews because they claim that they speak Hebrew. What they really speak is not Hebrew, it's Aramaic, but they call it Hebrew. 
And then there's others whom they call the Hellenists because they grew up elsewhere, because they speak what was the lingua franca of all of the Eastern Mediterranean, which was Greek, and therefore the other Jews call those Hellenists. So you have the, the Hebrews, which are, who are really Aramaic-speaking Jews, and the Hellenists, who are really Greek-speaking Jews, all of them equally Jewish. But there is murmuring. And the murmuring, by the way, is against the leadership. Luke has just told us just before that, that people who brought offerings to be distributed brought and laid them at the feet of the apostles. So it was the apostles who were doing the distribution. And there's murmuring, because somehow things don't seem to be fair. And that comes to me, what I think is the first surprise of the story. The apostles listen. <laughs> the superintendents listen. <laughs> the apostles listen. They don't say, as we might, they might say, you know, uh, these widows are getting something already. They just don't know their place. We're helping them. Let them be happy with that. They don't talk about the, the problem of the widows. You see, today we'll say that the problem is the widows, the problem of the poor, the problem of the ethnic minorities, the problem of those people. But if you read the book of Acts, the problem is not the problem of the widows. The problem is the problem of a Holy Spirit who on that day of Pentecost poured its power on everyone, young and old, sons and daughters, Medes and Parthians and everybody else, and invited them all to join. All of them, each in their own language. The problem is not caused by the widows, or by the Hellenists, or by the apostles, or by the, the ones that they call Hebrews. The problem is caused by that subversive spirit of God who bloweth from where it listeth, and who destroys all our neat patterns and classifications and all that very set orders. And because the problem was caused by the spirit, the leadership took it seriously and decided something had to be done about it. Now that's something that they decided to do involves a new administrative structure. I don't know, the church seems to be doing that all the time. Whenever things don't seem to work, we reorganized. Okay? So they decide to reorganize. The 12th decide that they are to keep charge of proclaiming the gospel, evidently mostly in Aramaic, and they cannot in good conscience spend the time organizing the relief work of the church for the widows. It is important that someone do that for it, however, and so therefore they decide that they are going to elect seven members, seven men, the text says, we'll come back to that later, seven members to carry that task. And then therefore, there comes the second great surprise in the text. First surprise is that the apostles listen. The second surprise is that those who have chosen all have Greek names. There's not one Simon, one Jude, one Eli. They are, what? Stephen and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus. And this Nicolaus, the text even says more than that, says that he was a proselyte from Antioch, because he was not even born a Jew. He was a Gentile who in the city of Antioch somehow had joined Judaism and now is in Jerusalem. So he is even worse than just a regular Hebrew, um, Hellenist. Now, there is more to that, though, because there's a political situation in Jerusalem in which empowering the Greek-speaking segment of the congregation will have to be a very courageous thing to do. You see, it might raise questions about the church in the wider city. It will lead to strife and conflict. People, in, not just in church, but people in Jerusalem, were divided between these two groups. You have the, the, the old, 
a population that had grew up in Judea, people who speak Aramaic, people who have been there all their lives, people who know what it means to be a Jew, and then you have all these other people, mostly newcomers. One of the things that happens is Jews want to die in Jerusalem, so they'll be there at the day of the resurrection. And so Jerusalem becomes sort of like uh, uh, the New Testament Florida. See? <laughs> See? Oh. <laughs> See? Oh, the old people move there, and you have all of these elderly people. That's why the widows are so important here. See, you have all these elderly people who have come sort of as immigrants to be in Jerusalem, but the others who have been there all the time, I'm not quite sure that these people are quite real Jews. They don't eat the same foods. They don't speak the same language. They don't have the same customs. Uh, they are not respectable folk like we are. Perhaps you should all just go home. You know? Furthermore, if you look at uh, the whole uh, story of Scripture, you realize that every time that the people of Israel have been unfaithful, God has put them in the hands of some tyrant. Could it be that the reason why Israel is not what it used to be is because all of these newcomers, all of these Hellenists who have come on, come into our land, somehow God is punishing us, and now we are subject to the Roman Empire. Can we make Israel great again? Let's make Israel great again by getting rid of all these people. Sounds familiar, but I won't talk about that. You can imagine the, in the, the Scots the debates that I have recently in the church. You know, if we really bring these people in and make them full partners of the church, what's going to happen to the prestige of the church in this society? Giving is going to go down. That's the superintendent's worry, right? <laughs> Giving is going to go down. We are going to lose respectability. Actually, if you read the whole story, you realize that that's what happens. When you read the book of Acts, and people haven't noticed this, but let me just tell you this. Look at the book of Acts again. And look at the first five chapters. And in those first five chapters, the people, actually the word people, are in favor of the ones that are following Jesus. There's not one negative word from what the people say about the Christians. It's, it's usually it's the, the high priests and the guards of the, of the temple and the elders and the scribes and, and the, the, the social dome of, of uh, Jerusalem that really dislikes the Christians. But the people are for the Christians. And if you keep on reading, it is in chapter 6, just after what we have read, that finally the people turn against the Christians. And persecution breaks out. And interesting enough, persecution is not against just all Christians, it's against the Hellenist Christians. The 12 stay in Jerusalem. Philip dies. I mean, uh, Stephen dies. Uh, Philip leaves. The others are exiled. But the, the, the 12 stay in Jerusalem because they are Hebrews. They can stay there. So what the church is doing by putting these people in positions of power is really a very dangerous thing and a very unpopular thing. And yet, that is part of what the church does. Hmm? But then comes the third surprise of the text. You remember that the twelve had decided that they are going to keep the preaching to themselves, and the seven are going to be the ones who are going to be distributing the resources of the church. And then immediately after what I have read to you, it says that Stephen, one of the twelve, full of grace and of the Spirit, began preaching. And he has all this great success. And people are upset. And then comes the story of Stephen that all of you know. One thing that I find interesting in this whole story is that Stephen, who's not supposed to be preaching, the apostles did not want him to be preaching. Stephen, who's not supposed to be preaching, preaches the longest sermon in the whole book of Acts. So if my sermon is long, you'll forgive me anyhow. <laughs> Don't stone me. <laughs> you see, the 12 
are structural conservatives. They apparently believe that their task is to preserve the structure that existed in the beginning, perhaps with some minor adjustment here and there, you know, little tweaks so that people things can work. And so in chapter one, even before the spirit comes to them, they decide, you know, we were 12, and we ought to be 12, and 12 we will be, so let's go ahead and name another one. And by the way, they do something very interesting that I notice sometimes in the church too. Uh, if you look at the requisites that Peter puts forth for those who, that one who's going to be elected in Judas's place, the requisites are someone who has been with us since the beginning and all the way to the end. Go read the gospel again. Of the 12 that were there, only three had been with them from the beginning. And only one had stayed firm to the end. All the others don't meet the requirements they are now setting for the outsiders that are coming in. That's another issue that very often you find in church. But anyhow, the Spirit had other plans. And apparently, I don't know what happened to Matthias. The Acts never tells us. But uh, he didn't seem to have done much. And now, the 12 are willing to give up the ministry, to serve at the tables. They are willing to name others who are going to share some of the authority. But they are not ready. They are not ready to have all of these Hellenists be the ones preaching the word. That is for us, the old time good Aramaic speaking folk. Ah, they are not ready, but the Spirit is ready. And uh, Spirit, full of power and grace, began preaching. You see, the importance of that, I think that the significance of that is enormous. There is a tendency in every church and in every denomination to think that there is a God-given structure and that that structure must remain, remain forever and you must always do things the way they were done before, perhaps with some minor adjustments here and there. In my own United Methodist Church, I often say that the Methodist Church is very liberal when it comes to Scripture and very fundamentalist when it comes to the discipline. So you cannot, you cannot fool with the discipline. You can fool with Scripture, but, but not, not with the discipline. Uh, likewise, the 12 decide that seven have to be named, and they decide that these seven are going to be men. Seven men are going to be named. And the congregation did name seven names. And hopefully, if today we were dealing with an issue having to do with the widows in the church, we would know better than the appointed committee composed of seven men. And we might think to think that that is because of modern times. Modern times have taught us that things are not that way and so forth. But perhaps, could it be perhaps that it is not only the result of modern times, it's also the result of the work of the Spirit, the same Spirit who made Philip and Stephen be preachers of the gospel when they were not supposed to be, and who now is moving the church beyond the other point. And then there is the fourth surprise, the greatest surprise of the whole book of Acts. Because the early church took the risk of responding to injustice by opening up its leadership. Because the early church took the risk of having bad words spoken about it in the community around it. Because the early church risked its own prestige and its own popularity because the early church did all of that in obedience to the Spirit. Because of that, the mission progressed far beyond their own expectations. And the mission took directions that we, they would never have expected. If you look at the entire book of Acts, you see that what happens very, in, the, in the very next, chapter, next section after their name, as I told you earlier, Stephen is preaching. And you go to the next 
to, to chapter 8. Chapter 7 is where he preaches long sermon and he's then killed. Chapter 8 is another of the seven who's now taking the gospel to Samaria and to indirectly through the eunuch to Ethiopia. And you go to chapter 9, and it's neither one of the 12, nor one of the seven, but somebody else. An outsider. Actually, I have time, so let me tell you this. Very often we say that Paul really didn't know what was going on. He was just there, happened to come by, and he saw this mess, all these people shouting and so on, and so he stood there and held their clothes. Look again at the story. The people who make the arrangements to have Stephen falsely accused, to even go out and get witnesses and so on, belong to several synagogues. And one of the synagogues is the synagogue of the Cilicians. And the capital of Cilicia is a city called Tarsus. So Paul's synagogue is probably the synagogue of the Cilicians. And if Paul was a leader in the synagogue, it is very unlikely that he didn't know what was going on. So he does, he's not just some person who just walks by and sees all of this multitude and then decides he's going to join them and stands around and holds it close. He is part of those who were persecuting the church. And be beginning with, with Stephen. So at any rate, what happens then is in the book of Acts, going back to what I was saying earlier, in the book of Acts, you move from the 12 to the 7 and then from the 7 to another one who's neither one of the 12 nor one of the 7 who's one that you know as the Apostle Paul. And what's interesting about all that is that mission moves from the Hebrews, who well, are not really Hebrews. Okay? Hmm? We all tend to create false images of our, about our own background and our own past. Hmm? Things used to be so great back in the 50s, you know? Yeah. Everybody we are the Hebrews. We really are the heirs of all the ancient prophets because we speak the same language, but we don't. You know? It's all, it's truth to it, but it's also a truth mixed with, with nationalistic, ethnocentric myths. Okay? And so, these, uh, from, from the seven, from the twelve to the seven to Paul, and from Paul, through sundry and various ways, through mysterious ways, to each one of us who's here today. I doubt that there are many of us here today whose name uh, is a Ben something or other. I doubt there are many here of us today who have been able to hear of this faith, had it not been because back then, the church was willing to hear the promptings of the Spirit, even when they were challenging, even when they denied their own goals, even when they might make the church take questionable positions vis-a-vis -vis the society around them. And because the church did that, we are here tonight, or this morning. I slept late last night. <laughs> <laughs> we are here this morning. Okay. So, the issues posed by that passage continue to this day. They continue at the level of the local congregation, where we have to see, think about what do we do with this population that's changing around us, and that's not a problem. The problem is the spirit that's brought those people next to us. And the question is whether we listen to the Spirit or we don't. It continues at the level of the worldwide church. We worry because Christianity seems to be losing ground in its own traditional areas. And we don't rejoice that the same Spirit who made the church get those seven and become leaders, even though at its, the church's own suffering 
that that same spirit may very well be the one that is changing the map of Christianity today and is bringing to us all of these people that we did not even count and all of these realities that are taking place in, in Angola and in India and in China and in South America, that all of that is part of the work of the same spirit. Could it be that that spirit is calling us today to begin looking at people that we have usually not considered up for leadership? In the very early church, the Hellenists, later women. Could it be that the spirit is calling us to look at those people whom society around us spurns and considers inferior and see them as the gift of the Spirit to us. And I think until we face that question squarely, we will be talking a whole lot about renewing the churches. We will be talking a whole lot about mission to minorities. But in fact, all our talk will be talk about mission and will remain that. And if we do face the issue, if we realize that it is not just a question of looking good, we have to bring all these minorities in because otherwise we wouldn't look good. Or political correctness because that is what you know, the new modern world expects of us. If we realize that it's not any of those things, but it's really a question of being true to our mission, of being obedient to that subversive Holy Spirit given to us at Pentecost. If we do that, then what happened in this story will happen again. And the Word of God will continue to spread. And the number of the disciples will increase greatly as it excess. And not just in the past in Jerusalem, but today in Greenville, and in Illinois, and in the Midwest, and to the ends of the earth. So be it. Amen. La gracia de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, el amor de Dios el Padre y la comunión del Espíritu Santo sean con todos y cada uno de ustedes, ahora y por siempre jamás. Amén.